because uh, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis is uh, such a common problem in our country, um, accordingly, liver malignancies are also seen fairly commonly. And uh, one of the commonest uh, tumors in Pakistan is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, but hepatocellular carcinoma is not the only tumor uh, which we can see uh, arising in liver. Uh, there can be a number of malignancies arising in liver tissue. However, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is the, uh, is the commonest of the primary tum tumors in liver. Uh, yet, the, the commonest malignancy which we see in affecting the liver is secondaries arising in other tissues elsewhere outside the liver. So the primary uh, tumors of liver can, can be divided according to, the, to the, the type of cell that they arise from and uh, these can be hepatocytes. Uh, when the tumor arises from hepatocytes, it's called hepatocellular carcinoma. Similarly, when the tumor arises from BDD epithelial cells, it's the, they're called uh, cholangiocytes. Uh, the tumor is called cholangiocarcinoma and another one is called BDD cyst adenoma. Uh, tumors arising from endothelial cells uh, can be angiocytes sarcomas or epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And then there are uh, yet other type of uh, tumor called mesenchymal uh, tumors. And uh, the tumor arising from mesenchymal cells is hepatoblastoma. So we will ma mainly be talking about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma today and uh, a brief introduction about cholangiocarcinoma. The rest of the tumors are fairly uncommon tumors and we don't need to discuss them in detail uh, today. So as I mentioned, the, the commonest uh, uh, type of tumor that we see uh, in liver is uh, secondaries from other, other sites. Uh, whenever we uh, have a suspicion of uh, a malignancy or a nodule in liver uh, seen on imaging, there are more chances that it would be, it would be a secondary tumor from another site rather than a primary one. But when there is a primary tumor, it, ha it either has to be in paracelular carcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma in, in most of the cases. So the hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma as, uh, as I mentioned is the most common primary liver cancer. Uh, in more than 90% of the cases it, uh, it arises on a background of chronic liver disease uh, that is uh, with or without cirrhosis. Uh, but cirrhosis itself is a risk factor for development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Risk factors uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma, as I mentioned, uh, cirrhosis of the liver from any cause is a risk factor. Then chronic viral hepatitis B and C, alcoholism, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, hereditary hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and the list goes on. By far, the commonest risk factors which we see in our in our clinical practice in Pakistan are chronic viral hepatitis B and C and leading to cirrhosis. Uh, while some patients do have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis as a background disease, uh, yet others have uh, an unknown uh, cause of cirrhosis. Uh, we call it cryptogenic cirrhosis. So what's the pathology? Uh, usually, the hepatocellular carcinoma is seen as either a solitary or a circumscribed uh, nodule, but they, they, it can uh, present as multiple nodules in liver tissue also. Sometimes uh, it can even be uh, an infiltrative tumor which uh, involves the liver tissue uh, in a generalized fashion and we can't see a single nodule or a, a space occupying lesion. Uh, on gross pathology, uh, the tumors usually are soft yellow with areas of necrosis and the, on histopathology, the cells of hepatocellular carcinoma resemble uh, those of normal liver tissue called normal hepatocytes, uh, and, but it, it, dep it depends upon the, the differentiation uh, of the, the, the cancer 
uh, it can be uh, well differentiated, moderately differentiated and poorly differentiated and accordingly the, the cells would resemble the hepatocytes in the same uh, degree. Uh, immunohistochemistry, immunohistochemistry, these, these hepatocellular carcinoma cells, they stain positive for CD10 and uh, uh, C carcinoma embryonic antigen. This is called polyclonal carcinoma embryonic antigen. So this uh, slide shows the pathway towards uh, leading towards the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, as you can see, uh, the major pathway is through cirrhosis. So patients develop cirrhosis because of a variety of causes, which can be uh, viral hepatitis, hemochromatosis alcohol or non-alcoholic state of hepatitis, then uh, they develop chronic liver disease and eventually develop cirrhosis and in the cirrhotic liver tissue they go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, but then there are uh, a few patients which uh, develop hepatocellular carcinoma without first developing cirrhosis. So, um, especially the patients who have uh, hepatitis B and hemochromatosis, they can develop hepatocellular carcinoma without first developing cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is not mandatory uh, for development of hepatocellular carcinoma, but it is uh, the commonest background uh, disease. So what are the clinical features? Obviously, uh, in, in most cases, we will find that the patient has a background of chronic liver disease, uh, it can be pre-serotic or uh, serotic uh, and accordingly the features of the background chronic liver disease will vary uh, from minimal to a full-blown uh, picture. Patients can also uh, present as the first decompensation of a previously unknown chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. Uh, so what happens is that the, the cirrhosis remains uh, compensated for a long period of time till the time the patient develops hepatocellular carcinoma and when that happens they develop decompensation in the form of uh, ascites or abdominal pain, jaundice, uh, very still bleeding, hepatic encephalopathy and so forth. Sometimes uh, a previously known patient with cirrhosis develops worsening, certain, certain worsening of the clinical features. For example, um, SITs may become refractory or a patient may become, may become deeply jaundiced uh, or uh, refractory or deep hepatic encephalopathy may develop. Uh, then uh, these patients can have right hypochondrial pain, uh, understandably because of the presence of tumor. Then uh, in some patients, they do not have any symptoms because of the hepatocellular carcinoma itself and they are picked up incidentally on imaging for an unrelated cause. Uh, uh, so yet some uh, other patients will uh, be picked up on surveillance uh, of hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, when the patient is diagnosed with, with cirrhosis, they are recommended to have surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma um, in the form of uh, six monthly ultrasound or uh, with alpha fetoprotein and it is usually with the ultrasound that uh, a nodule is picked up which was previously not seen and then we go on to investigate it further and we find out that the nodule is in fact hepatocellular carcinoma. So these are the, the, the clinical features of any chronic liver disease or cirrhosis and uh, you may expect any of these to be present in a patient with hepatocellular carcinoma also. I'm sure you all are aware of these features already. So how do we diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma? As we talked uh, already, uh, it is mostly picked up as a nodule on uh, an imaging modality. Uh, when, whether it is suspected or not, uh, the imaging is the 
modality we use to find out if there is a nodule in the liver tissue and it, it is seen as space, space occupying lesion. Uh, the first modality usually is the ultrasound and uh, but ultrasound itself is not enough to diagnose uh, cerebral carcinoma. Uh, we need at least two modalities and uh, the, 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 com the commonest uh, modality we use uh, uh, to diagnose cerebral carcinoma is uh, triple phase and contrast and CT scan of liver and it gives us uh, a typical contrast enhancement pattern uh, of the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and on a background of uh, cirrhosis this typical contrast enhancement is uh, enough to diagnose uh, hepatocellular carcinoma you don't need to go for a biopsy uh, if these, these conditions are met that is the patient has the right background uh, liver disease cirrhosis and then they have uh, an S well in the liver uh, with an enhancement pattern which is typical for hepatocellular carcinoma. Then these patients also have uh, elevated uh, levels of alpha fetoprotein but its role is supportive and it, it is not diagnostic. So when do we need a biopsy? We don't need a biopsy for typical cases in which there is cirrhosis, there is an S well in the liver and the, the enhancement pattern is typical uh, but in those patients in whom the biopsy sorry in the, uh, the enhancement pattern is not typical of hepatocellular uh, uh, carcinoma uh, or if the tumor size is less than 2 cm then we, we need to go for a biopsy and uh, uh, it's in these cases that a biopsy will confirm or exclude a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. How do we stage uh, hepatocellular carcinoma? Uh, the commonest staging uh, and the system for uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, BCLC staging system. Uh, it is Barcelona uh, Clinic Liver Cancer Staging and it takes into account uh, different parameters, for example, tumor size, number of uh, tumor nodules, then uh, severity of the underlying disease, which is measured by child view uh, class, and then patient's performance status, that is uh, the performance score, which we calculate from uh, ECOG uh, performance status scoring. So, what is the treatment? So, um, if the patient is healthy enough, if they can tolerate and if the tumor is uh, small and limited, then we go for a curative treatment. And what are the different modalities with which we can uh, try to cure hepatocellular carcinoma? These include percutaneous ethanol injection, um, radiofrequency ablation, then surgical section of the of the tumor, which often involves a lobectomy uh, or segmentectomy. Then uh, some patients will need liver transplant uh, to cure their hepatocellular carcinoma. Many of these patients they do not have a curable tumor uh, in the sense that the tumor is uh, very large and multinodular or the patient is, is not fit enough to undergo a surgical section. So in that case, we only aim for palliation, the best palliation that we can offer to the patient. And the, the modalities for palliation for these patients are uh, TACE, which is the short form for trans-arterial chemoembolization, uh, TEAR, trans-arterial uh, radio embolization and then there are many uh, systemic therapies available. The systemic therapies that we most commonly use uh, is sorafenib, but then there are recently developed medicines which include levatinib, uh, rigorafenib and nivolumab. 
So that was you know, all about basal carcinoma. So the next malignancy that we are going to talk about is cholangiocarcinoma. As uh, we, we initially mentioned, that cholangiocarcinomas arise from epithelial cells in the bile duct called cholangiocytes. Uh, cholangiocarcinomas are categorized by their anatomical location. They can be intrahepatic or can be extrahepatic. Then those uh, which are extrahepatic uh, are further divided into perihyal and distal extrahepatic tumors. The perihyal tumors are also called clad skin tumors. Um, we will see uh, a, a picture which shows us which uh, tumor is located in which part of the uh, biliary system. So you can see uh, the intrahepatic tumors are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas are those which arise from the biliary system above the level of bifurcation of the, uh, the, the common hepatic duct. So any tumor, any cholangiocarcinoma arising inside the liver tissue or above the level of uh, common hepatic duct is uh, uh, going to be called as intrahepatic tumor intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Then there are perihyalar tumors. Perihyalar tumors are those which uh, arise from the biliary system between the, the, uh, the, the point where the cystic duct joins the bile duct and the bifurcation of the common hepatic duct or we can also call it confluence of uh, right and left hepatic ducts. So any tumor, any cholangiocarcinoma arising from this part of the biliary system is going to be called uh, perihyalar or clad skin tumor. And all the cholangiocarcinomas which arise beneath the level of the uh, cystic duct joining the bile duct, uh, that is the common bile duct, uh, is called distal extrahepatic tumor. So why do we want to categorize these patients? Uh, into these categories because the, the treatment will uh, vary according to the location of the tumor. What are the risk factors for uh, cholangiocarcinoma? So uh, the commonest risk factors include primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, liver cirrhosis, cholidocal cysts, uh, calories disease. Calories disease is, is a type of cholidocal cyst uh, but it is often categorized separately when uh, numerous cysts develop inside the biliary system uh, in the hepatic parenchyma. Then hepatolithiasis and liver fluke infection uh, such as chronotis, sinensis and alcohol, they are all risk factors for uh, developing cholangiocarcinoma. What are the clinical features? So, uh, clinical features will also depend upon the location of the tumor. Ex Extrahepatic tumors often present uh, when they, they cause obstruction of the biliary system and obstruction of the biliary system then leads to uh, jaundice, pruritus, uh, clay colored stools, abdominal pain and weight loss. Sometimes these patients can also have fever. Oh, in contrast to the extrahepatic tumors, uh, the intrahepatic tumors, they do not present with biliary obstruction. They usually present with abdominal pain, weight loss and uh, a space occupying lesion which is found on imaging. How do we diagnose uh, patients with cholangiocarcinoma? So, uh, for the diagnosis of uh, extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas, uh, we first suspect these when we have obstructive LFTs, when there is uh, raised alkaline phosphatase as compared to alanine transaminase. We go on to uh, have imaging and a nodule or mass is found on imaging such as ultrasound contrast enhanced CT scan of uh, abdomen or an MRCP magnetic resonance cholangio pancreatography. Uh, then uh, because of the obstruction of the biliary system, 
uh, upstream dilatation of the bile ducts is often a feature and we can also find out the, the level of transition where the tumor is present above that level the ability channels will be dilated and below that level the ability channels will be in norm, normal in caliber then we have to uh, do some imaging uh, for staging of the disease also and that might include PET scanning, CT scan of the chest, pelvis and neck also. In these tumors we do have to go for a biopsy and uh, get a tissue diagnosis and for that uh, we can do that either by doing a brushing cytology on uh, during a procedure like ERCP we will discuss the indications for ERCP uh, in a minute and then we can have some uh, biopsy through the micro forceps uh, technique uh, which is a, a very very tiny forceps that goes through the uh, a baby scope through the adult scope so basically it is a very tiny uh, forceps that goes inside the bile duct, reaches the, the level of the tumor and then can grasp a, a piece of tissue from there. Uh, then we can also get a biopsy from uh, the, the, the tumor uh, via an EUS. Uh, EUS is an endoscopic ultrasound. So endoscopic ultrasound can uh, give us access to the uh, to the tumor and we use needles that go through the, the GI tract reach the, type, the, the the location of the tissue and we aspirate some tissue from there we can either have cells or sometimes we can be, if we are lucky lucky enough we can even get a core of tissue from there then in some patients we have to get a CT guided biopsy because uh, either the EUS is not available or ERCP is not successful. So that, that was about the extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas, then, then come the intrahepatic ones and uh, intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas are diagnosed with imaging. So they are suspected uh, on imaging uh, like a triple phase CECT scan uh, or an MRI. In fact, MRI is more uh, specific uh, for diagnosis of these tumors. But um, uh, a space occupying lesion uh, in the liver can be a benign pro uh, problem, it can be a hepatocellular carcinoma, it can be a secondary, or it can be a cholangiocarcinoma. So, uh, triple phase contrastron CT scan will. Uh, reveal a pattern of enhancement which is not typical for hepatocellular carcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma is usually excluded with that and then we go on to have a biopsy. And the biopsy can be either CT guided or ultrasound guided. In some patients in whom uh, we are, we have a very strong suspicion that the lesion is malignant, then we do not go for a biopsy and we straight away proceed to uh, curative surgery. It is in only in those patients who are fit enough to undergo surgery and in whom, in whom the tumor is uh, still small enough to be resected. So uh, in those patients we go for surgery and we get the tissue diagnosis only on the resected specimen. So what is the treatment? Uh, curative treatment for cholangiocarcinoma is always uh, surgery. For intrahepatic ones, we go for a resection of the tumor uh, with clear margins, of course. Uh, in some patients in whom we have uh, other liver disease, chronic liver disease, for example, going on, uh, we can also opt for uh, liver transplant. Although liver transplant was was until recently considered a, a relative contraindication for patients with cholangiocarcinoma, but now it is no longer a contraindication and liver transplant can be considered in a patient uh, with cholangiocarcinoma for curative treatment. The extrahepatic 
glandiocarcinomas. Uh, and the treatment for these is, and the curative treatment for these is end block dissection of bile duct and, and gallbladder. Sometimes when the tumor is too close to the liver tissue, uh, we may have to go for a hepatic lobectomy along with end block dissection of bile duct and gallbladder. If the tumor is too far down in the, in the common bile duct, then sometimes we have to go for uh, resection of the, the pancreatic head also and uh, uh, do and why hepatic jejunostomy has to be performed. In addition to the surgery, we go either for a new adjuvant or an adjuvant chemotherapy also. We don't need to discuss that in detail here. So what happens with the non-resectable tumors? So when the tumor is not curable or when, for example, the tumor is too large, it involves vital structures like blood vessels or portal vein or, um, or the uh, bile ducts on both sides of the liver. Uh, what we can do is, uh, the in, the, for the intrahepatic ones, we can go for radiotherapy or chemotherapy, uh, which can provide some variation to these patients. Uh, for the extrahepatic ones, again, radiotherapy and chemotherapy can be employed. Uh, but these patients have a lot of symptoms because of the biliary obstruction and relieving that obstruction uh, gives them uh, quite a bit of relief from, from these symptoms like pruritus and uh, uh, this associated discomfort um, and for uh, obstruct, relief, relieving that obstruction uh, we can either go for ERCP and put in a stent across the, the, the site of uh, obstruction so which relieves the obstruction of the bile flow and the bile starts flowing down into the, into the duodenum and the, the jaundice disappears, the patient becomes uh, free of pruritus and their quality of life improves but obviously it's not going to cure the, the, the disease. Uh, when ERCP is not possible, we can, uh, we can go for PTBD. PTBD is the short form for percutaneous transpatic biliary drainage. When we go through the skin into the liver tissue and find out uh, a, a dilated radical of the biliary channel and, and through that we put in uh, a drain which drains the bile uh, outside the, the body and into a bag and that again relieves the, uh, the pruritus and jaundice. Right, so the next uh, part of our lecture is liver transplant. A liver transplant is one of the rapidly emerging and growing uh, treatment modalities for a variety of liver diseases. In fact, some of the diseases which, which do not involve liver also. Uh, so it is a procedure uh, in which we take uh, a healthy liver tissue from a donor and put part of it into the, the recipient who has uh, malfunctioning liver or cirrhotic uh, liver or some other disease also. So the donor can be a living donor or it can be a deceased donor. So uh, in Pakistan we are only having uh, living donor liver transplants uh, as yet, uh, the deceased donor livers are still not available in, in uh, enough quantity, so we do not have uh, these procedures here. But uh, all over the world, the deceased donor liver transplant program is the most commonly performed uh, procedure. So what is the, the chance of success? So uh, generally, uh, one year survival after a liver transplant is about 89-90%. So it's fairly successful uh, procedure. Uh, whereas the five year survival in these patients is about 75%. Still uh, a good one. It is because if we do not perform the liver transplant in these patients, the patients have uh, uh, conditions uh, with which they would otherwise not be able to survive for beyond a few months time. 
what are the indications for liver transplant? Liver cirrhosis is by far the commonest uh, indication uh, in the adult population. Uh, it can be due to any of the causes of liver cirrhosis like hepatitis B, C, D, uh, acute liver